Burgundy in eastern France. This little village may look peaceful enough, but beneath its rooftops, fierce passions smolder. This is no ordinary village. Down that street, behind high walls and locked gates, is the Queen of Burgundy, in exile, snubbed and plotting to get even. Round the corner is her royal palace, the celebrated Domaine de la Romanie Conti. But after a palace coup, she's been unceremoniously booted out, and the Domaine's now occupied by her sworn enemies. At that end of the village is another eminence, the Pope of Burgundy, Henri Jaillet. He's now largely given up earthly matters. These are the nobility, some of the characters of the extraordinary little village of Vaune Romanée, world famous for its bottles to die for. There's only one reason why the world ever got to hear of Vaughan Romanet, and it's this, Pinot Noir, the red burgundy grape. It's one of the most difficult grapes to make decent wine out of. Outside Burgundy, it's almost impossible not to over-ripen it. Here in Burgundy, it can be difficult to ripen at all, and in damp weather, it's all too prone to rot. It's difficult to convey the mood of complete, all-embracing depression that settles on a wine region when it rains during vintage time. It's not just the hundreds of vine growers who depend for their income on how many ripe, healthy grapes they can sell, but it's all the shopkeepers, all the locals, who are plunged into the deepest gloom. It looks as though this will be another less than stunning vintage in Burgundy. Barely one vintage or harvest in three is generally a success. And, thanks to often poor winemaking and demand way in excess of supply, I reckon about four out of five red burgundies that I taste are disappointments. But when it's good, it's so extraordinarily good that we wine nuts are prepared to put up with this shocking failure rate. If red Bordeaux's appeal is strictly above the neck, that of red burgundy is something completely different. But you have to pay heavily for such pleasures. You've got young burgundies here that cost hundreds of pounds a bottle. Why, why so expensive in burgundy? Well, yeah, it is true that uh, the, the burgundy, particularly the best burgundies, are very expensive. Um, it's partly to do with the, uh, the great quality, because they are great wines, but also to do with the rarity. Some of these wines are produced in minute quantities. Uh, you take, for example, a, a Richebourg from Henri Jaillet, and he literally makes two barrels of that wine every year. So that means the 600 bottles for the whole world. So if you, if you buy a, a case of that wine, you're buying 2% of the total production. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Alors ça, c'est le dernier an euh, qui m'appartient. Plus quelques, ce qu'on appelle des pointes, c'est-à-dire des... Des, des rangs qui ne sont pas aussi longs que les autres. Mais pourquoi vous avez tellement autant de, de petites parcelles dans une Mais grande Tout simplement, c'est le morcellement qui est dû aux héritages successifs. Cette parcelle, à l'origine, appartenait en entier à mon père. Elle a été divisée en deux à son décès. Et moi, euh, comme j'ai deux filles, j'ai donc partagé également la parcelle en deux. Ce qui fait maintenant trois propriétaires au lieu d'un. <rire> Mais comment vous, vous pouvez distinguer entre les, les parcelles différentes Parce qu'à moi, elles ont tous la même euh, apparence. Oui, hein? mais ça c'est d'abord... Théoriquement, il doit y avoir des bornes. Hein, c'est borné. Mais la plupart des bornes ont disparu euh, du fait des charrues. Elles ont été arrachées par les, uh -huh. par les tracteurs. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Et maintenant, on les reconnaît uniquement à la différence de culture, de façon culturelle. 
euh, et puis parce qu'on a l'habitude, on sait, euh, les pieds ne sont pas les mêmes, vous voyez, les, les grosseurs de pieds diffèrent, enfin il y a différentes choses qui nous permettent de, de, de ne pas nous tromper. Et ça arrive jamais que les bourguignons se marient afin d'acquérir... Ah, euh, si, euh, c'est assez fréquent qu'il y a évidemment des mariages entre euh, fils de vignerons et, et filles de vignerons. Et à ce moment-là, évidemment, le domaine, au lieu de se disperser, devient plus gros. The Cote d'Or, an unspectacular east-facing slope on which are all of Burgundy's world-famous vineyards and a string of villages with names such as Nuit Saint-Georges and gevry chambertin Until 30 years ago, these vineyards were farmed by simple peasants who sold their grapes to local wine merchants who'd mix them all together and sell them under their own names. Then in the 60s, the world's wine drinkers were introduced to the concept of domaine bottled Burgundy, wine produced by the growers themselves. Prices for these seriously authentic wines took off. Suddenly, men of the soil, like Henri Jaillet, were rich. Not that this encouraged him to invest in any smart new machinery. No concessions to modern technology here. Just a sorting table to make sure that any less than perfect Pinot Noir grape is used for vineyard fertilizer instead of wine. Burgundy's most respected winemaker makes all of his wine in his garage and beneath it. C'est une toute petite cave parce que tout simplement je n'ai jamais voulu faire beaucoup de vin pour pouvoir euh, tout faire par moi-même. Et qu'est-ce que c'est Alors ça ce sont des magnums de l'année 1986 qui sont destinés à être vendus d'ici quelques années. Ça vaut euh, des, des milliards de non, francs, hein? Non, n'exagérons rien, mais enfin, <rire> ça vaut quand même euh, un certain prix. <rire> mais les prix de vos vins sont assez élevés, oui, hein? oui. Vous n'avez pas de plainte des clients? Non, non, non. non. Le client ne oui. demande jamais le prix des vins quand il les achète. Ce qu'il veut, c'est en avoir. <rire> c'est tout. C'est merveilleux pour euh, vous. Oui, c'est parce... merveilleux. Ah, ça, ce sont des prunes qui ont été mises en conserve et qu'on va faire des tartes en, 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 en hiver. Ah. Et vous voyez, on a aussi des haricots verts ici qui, qui sont destinés à la même chose, <rire> à être euh, mangés au cours d'hiver. Uh -huh. okay. Mais lequel est votre secret comme vinificateur. Ah, hein? oh, vous savez, je n'ai pas de secret. Hein? Je laisse tout simplement faire la nature. Moi, je ne suis pas courageux de nature, et comme la, comme la nature fait tellement bien le travail, je ne vois pas pourquoi je me substituerais à elle. Mais pourquoi les autres ne peuvent pas le faire ben, je crois qu'on est dans une période d'interventionnisme à tout prix, et tout le monde veut en rajouter un petit peu, alors que ce n'est pas nécessaire. Henri Jaillet lives in a modest bungalow on the edge of the village. He's even embarrassed about owning a Mercedes, although Vaughan is known as Mercedes City nowadays. For all his newfound wealth, he hankers after the old days. C'était beaucoup plus convivial que maintenant, parce que à 9h, par exemple, on faisait un petit casse-croûte et tous les vignerons qui étaient dans le, dans le secteur se réunissaient et on discutait pendant une demi-heure de nos problèmes. On se connaissait mieux. Ben maintenant, on va dans, aux vignes en voiture, puis euh, on se contente en passant de faire un petit signe, bonjour, et puis c'est tout. Maintenant, à 8 heures, le pays est vide parce que tout le monde est devant la télévision et puis c'est comme ça. Marcel Marie Elise Leroy belongs to an altogether higher social stratum of Von Romanet. An awesomely fit 60 year old. Lalu was the first woman to scale some of the Alps' most terrifying rock faces. This, for her, is just an afternoon stroll fitted in between her other duties. Lalu is the queen of Burgundy, so-called because of her prodigious winemaking and tasting abilities. She is nothing if not fanatical. 
Her name has been synonymous with the most famous Burgundy domain of all, the Domaine de la Romani Conti. The domain, whose most sought after wine comes from the Romani Conti vineyard itself, is owned by two families, hers and the de Vilaines, between whom little love is lost. While Lalu is emotional, mercurial, and fiercely competitive, Aubert de Vilaine is mild and circumspect. Lalu accused him of letting standards slip and milking the domain for profit. Something had to give. Lalu was responsible for selling the domain's wines, according to a rather complicated formula. For the prize of securing one bottle of Romani Conti itself, you had to agree to buy 11 mixed bottles from the domain's other vineyards. Say, three bottles of Latache, three bottles of Richebourg, two bottles of Romani Saint-Vivant, two bottles of Grand Echezo, and two bottles of Ordinary Echezo. All of them top Grand Cru Red Burgundies, but without the magic of the name Romani Conti. Within this job lot, the Romani Conti was priced at about £170 a bottle, and the others all at much, much less. The system worked perfectly smoothly, until the Japanese arrived on the scene. So what happened was in the late 1980s, the Japanese suddenly discovered fine wine. Uh, being the Japanese, they wanted the best possible wine, they wanted the best labels. They, didn't, they weren't necessarily great connoisseurs of what was in the bottle, but they wanted the best. So Romani Conti was the wine they wanted. Uh, they were perfectly happy to pay a £1,000 a bottle, uh, but they had to have that particular wine. So we sold our Romani Conti at a huge profit, and then found we had the other 11 parts of the dozen that we could sell off at much less than our cost price. So we sold the, the other wines all over the place uh, at bargain prices. Well, this brought loads of problems because the, the wines that we had, had been selling really cheaply found their way onto the American market, and the prices there had been much, much higher. The consumers who'd bought at higher prices were really angry that, that they'd paid a lot of money for these wines, and now they could buy them much cheaper. So they were calling the American importer a crook, and, and he'd, he'd rip them off. The American importer was obviously really furious about the whole thing. He was, he was uh, threatening to sue, sue the domain and wanted to send all the wines back, and it all ended in tears. Lalu was blamed for this fiasco and was voted out by her sister, among others. She hasn't set foot in the place since. Now, all her energies are devoted to establishing a rival domain, also in the tiny village of Vaughan Romanet, aimed at making even better wines than Romani Conti. It's called Domaine Le Roi. It's staffed at vintage time by an intriguing blend of third world workers. And she now has help from above, in a curious mixture of astrology and homeopathy called biodynamism. Alors, la plante est composée de quatre parties les racines, les feuilles, la tige, et le raisin, le fruit. En elle sont en parfaite interférence les quatre éléments fondamentaux de l'univers la terre, l'eau, l'air et la chaleur. D'autre part, on sait que les douze constellations fixes du zodiaque sont groupées selon les radiations qu'elles envoient. Trois sont du groupe terre, trois sont du groupe eau. Trois sont du groupe air et trois sont du groupe feu. On va faire tous nos soins, enfin le maximum de nos soins à la terre et à la vigne lorsque la lune passera devant les constellations du groupe feu. It all sounds pretty potty to me, but it certainly produces healthy grapes, even in a damp vintage. Following her little red biodynamic Bible, during certain phases of the moon, she has a helicopter spray her vines with a mixture of nettle juice and crushed eggshells, with remarkably potent results. Et aussi par la tenue des raisins qui vont toujours vers la lumière. Ça, c'est un signe de biodynamie. Parce que ils ne tombent pas, de... pas comme, euh, comme, 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 comme des, euh, des pieds de vache, mais ils se redressent. 
Et c'est pas normal. On ne, on ne le voit pas partout. Hein. Non, ça c'est vraiment le signe de la biodynamie. Ouais, ouais. C'est vraiment le signe de la biodynamie. Mais l'année passée, euh, le, vous avez eu des problèmes, n'est-ce pas de, 2010, de oui. Le gros milieu, gros, qui, gros problème. Qui serait plus, plus facile si vous avez utilisé euh, une... Ah ben, si on avait fait la chimie, ben, absolument. Oui. Ouais. Absolument, on aurait arrêté net. Moi, je n'ai pas voulu le faire par respect par la, pour la vigne, puisque maintenant, euh, c'est ma conviction profonde. Hein. Je me demande si quelques-uns du village, par exemple, en, euh, se disaient « Ah, mais elle est stupide, pourquoi continuer avec... » Tout le monde l'a dit, tout le monde l'a bien dit. Tout le monde l'a bien dit, mais moi j'y crois. Puis c'est assez difficile de, de faire quelque chose contre ses convictions. C'est vrai. Surtout que je suis sûre que c'est à la gloire du vin, finalement. C'est le chemin de la qualité. And now, down to the cellar to taste her Richbourg, made from vines she provocatively bought just next to the domains. She's determined to see it command the same stratospheric price, at least. For me, it's the pleasure, I can assure you. Thank you. Thank you. Mmh. Mmh. Ça, c'est vraiment quelque chose. Hein? Mmh. Mmh. Ça, c'est Il m'a simplement dit dans la caisse, quand vous en verrez, mmh. que par hasard il y a un client privilégié qui a 12 mmh. bouteilles de ce vin. Alors, vous mettrez une petite note explicative et peut-être une bouteille d'eau pour qu'il le dilue un peu. Tellement il est concentré. Vous êtes assez protectif euh, vers vos vins, n'est-ce pas Oui, c'est ouais. vrai. Ouais. vrai. Je suis assez mère poule. Et si quelqu'un les critique, qu'est-ce qui se passe ben je, je, Quand même, je me demande s'ils ont raison. Parce qu'il faut que la critique soit positive, je pense. Si je me demande s'ils ont raison. Et s'ils n'ont pas raison, je me révolte. Hum. Comment ben, Ça peut aller jusqu'aux pleurs. Ça me, vraiment, ça me touche. Ça me touche énormément. Parce que bon, la perfection n'existe pas. C'est évident qu'on peut toujours, toujours faire mieux. C'est l'intérêt de, de notre métier. Et le sens de moi, c'est le sens un peu de ma vie. Hein. Et moi, j'ai un vin que je, je voudrais vous faire déguster, qui est un, un pinot. Vous n'avez jamais dégusté un, un Pinot d'ailleurs que vous avez aimé? C'est bon. C'est bon, mais ce n'est pas très grand. C'est un vin d'Oregon, un Pinot d'Oregon. C'est un Pinot, mais il n'a pas l'identité. Il n'a pas d'identité. C'est une sorte de vin, c'est une espèce de vin, c'est bien fait, c'est joli, c'est agréable. Mais il n'y a pas la vie, il n'y a pas d'identité. Mais vous pensez qu'il y aura un avenir pour euh, Pinot en Oregon Il ne faut pas qu'il fasse du Pinot, il faut qu'il fasse euh, telle appellation. Il faut qu'il trouve leur terroir, leur meilleur terroir. Pour le moment, c'est un vin de haute technologie, ça. C'est très bien fait. Mais le terroir, moi, je ne sais pas dire ce que c'est. Terroir, a word used as a mantra by French wine producers and conveniently untranslatable into other languages. It stands for the mix of place, soil and climate that determines the sort of wine a spot can produce. Lalou complains that here in Oregon, however suitably cool the climate, they haven't discovered their terroirs, so they're just making Pinot Noir, not an expression of place. Mind you, this could all be sour grapes. Oregon was the first place on earth to challenge Burgundy's unique right to make fine Pinot Noir. Number four, 
And number five. So every year they celebrate that fact by holding an international Pinot Noir festival, to which Pinot maniacs, producers and consumers like me, flock from all over the world for consumption disguised as education. In the, in the broad, I certainly agree with the concept of terroir in the sense that, that any wine, anywhere, is going to be shaped by the interaction of climate, soil, all of those extended things that go into terroir is necessarily going to impact on the wine. But I don't think that uh, uh, France has a monopoly um, of great terroir. Of course, if I were a French proprietor uh, with a distinguished appellation, I would wish it to be known that my wine can only be made there. Um, and that is true. But uh, one can equally well say, of course, that uh, uh, great Australian wine, I mean, the old cliches start to, come, start to come tumbling out, and it can only be made in Australia. What is terroir? I mean, that is the question. It used to be where um, I would sit with people around the table and they would tell me how they would, they would smell, oh, this is definitely Jeuver Chambertin. And um, I would say, gosh, I live uh, about three months here in Burgundy and you can taste it 60 growers in Jeuver Chambertin and taste 60 different examples of, of Pinot Noir produced in this, this area. I'm not quite sure there's any one that's supposed to be, in fact, Jeuver. And if James, um, the vineyard he works right now and, and produces wine from, if there was somebody, in fact, there before him producing wine and it wasn't very good, someone would come up and say, gosh, that's not a very good terroir for growing Pinot Noir. But here he's not using that old uh, um, harvesting machine and he's probably crop thinning prior to flowering and he's probably crop thinning afterwards and he's probably sorting out healthy from unhealthy fruit. That has nothing to do with terroir. That has everything to do with man's contribution. David Lett started the ball rolling. Well, I went to Davis, UC Davis, and got a degree in viticulture. And while I was there, a uh, professor said, there's no climate in California cool enough for Pinot Noir. That was pretty definitive, and I had discovered Pinot Noir at Davis. Having grown up near Salt Lake City, I wasn't exactly exposed to it. And I started looking around for various regions around the world, and the Willamette Valley of Oregon kept coming up as the place to grow Pinot Noir. Very similar climate to Burgundy, which I'm tasting right now. So you planted the first Pinot Noir vines? First Pinot Noir vines in the Willamette Valley, first vineyard in the Willamette Valley. And went ahead and had yes. great success with it? Yes, it worked. Do you still think there's nowhere in California that produces decent Pinot Noir? <laughs> Do I have to answer that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, you just gave me the answer. Yes. California produces a style of Pinot Noir that's uniform year in and year out, which is what Americans seem to prefer. prefer. They like homogenized milk, too. I can sort of like to see the pinnacles of Pinot Noir appear. And that can really only happen in a climate like this. can make decent Pinot Noir in California, an indecently good one started life in this shed. Bert Williams and Ed Selliam began making wine as a weekend hobby and turned into wine stars by accident. In the Russian River Valley, quite satisfactorily cooled every morning by fogs off the Pacific, William Selliam now has a set of smart new sheds. Here, they and their families handcraft Pinots that are so popular, even at $50 a bottle, that they sell out after only three weeks. I had made wine uh, on and off since 1964 for, as a home winemaker. Uh, and I read a lot. You know, I read a lot of books, read a lot of uh, 
things that had been translated from French. We looked a lot of old books up in the library that were from the 1800s uh, and talked to a lot of the older Italian winemakers that made wine in a traditional manner. And the way we made wine, because of our budget and everything, we did make wine in a traditional or old-fashioned way. We didn't have all the equipment everybody else had. And um, we thought that in doing it that way, we also saw a better wine coming out. Here, these are just being painted, so that's why everything's taken apart. But there's a tray up above, and there's two people on each station. And they sort the fruit. And the fruit goes directly into the fermenter tanks behind us. I've never seen anything like... I mean, I've seen things like this that are obviously very expensive and have cost people um, a lot of money. This is your own design? Yeah, I sort of uh, came up with the idea, and my uh, son-in-law did the design work and the engineering and the welding, and this is, <laughs> this is the result. And uh, this is something that we've been using for the last seven years. I've never seen fermentation tanks like this before. Well, they were from the dairy industry. Uh, we were able to pick them up at a bargain price because the dairy industry was having a problem in changing their tanks to uh, tanker trucks, and uh, these were surplus for them. So you literally so, cut the tops off? Yeah, we just cut the tops off, and uh, you use it pretty much in this form. And the grapes go directly into that tank. and ferment in that tank, we get good extraction. You've got lots and lots of area for the skins to float. Contact yeah. with the juice, yes. Yeah. What was the first signs that you were making wine everybody else thought was good? Probably, I think, when we started really taking off was when we were on television in 87 with the, uh, with the sweepstakes winner of 85. That would be the best wine of all varieties, all wineries in the state. That was one of the big ones, and then uh, just a constant recognition in the press. And uh, every time we do, we have more people phoning, can we have the wine, can we? And it, it just sort of pyramids and gets bigger and bigger in, in that way. So how much do you make now? 5,000 cases. How many could you sell, do you reckon, Ed? Uh, at full retail, uh, with, at the allocation levels we're doing now, probably at least 50% more. Uh, they would send that much in, in checks at least in three weeks. You know, if, you, if you send them put a mailer out, you could sell 50% more with not a problem at full retail, and they'd have their money here in three weeks. Okay. So you have to keep sending checks back, do you? Uh, refunds and uh, late checks if they don't get it here in three weeks, and those mm -hmm. all go back, and there's refunds that go back. And then this is on top of ev everybody being allocated in the first place. I would say for fall, last fall, there was probably 1,700 people that only got one bottle. God, what a business, just sending it out by the single bottle. Right. <laughs> but couldn't you increase production? But you could make uh, an awful lot more money than you do, couldn't you? Yeah. The government would get more of it, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very hard to believe that you've never been to Burgundy, because you're making these wines so much in the mould of Burgundy. Well, we always enjoyed Burgundy's. Mm -hmm. but uh, you don't want to go to Burgundy? Um, Passionately? Mm, you know, someday we may make it. <laughs> <laughs>